uh, it's an opportunity to talk to students about debate. Debate is uh, a fantastic sort of, well, pedagogical tool. And that's one of the reasons why I'm more than glad to come to class to talk about how you all can engage in uh, better debate. But the first question I want to ask you is, when you think of debate, what do you think of? Politics. Politics. And when you think of debate and politics, or at least that intersection, is that a positive one or is that less than positive? I mean, is that kind of debate good debate? Yes? No? Maybe a little bit? Well, um, usually not so much. And the reason why I'll say that is because, well, think about it this way. Uh, if any of you have seen the, the most recent presidential debates, for example, the moderators don't usually press candidates on the statements they make, especially ones outside of the debates. And so there's not a whole lot of follow through on kind of recommendations and suggestions that they're offering for the American public. Is that, pro is that a problematic to anybody else or is that just sort of like a me thing? It's like, well, that's, that's valuable, but it'd be nicer to know what you really think, really feel, and how that's meaningfully a valuable opportunity for the American public to do something better. Fair, uh, me then, okay. Um, so anybody else think of like, uh, well, let me quickly sort of tell you the story about how I got into debate. Anybody ever watch The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Carlton uh, was my motivation to debate. Now, that might seem silly to a lot of you, but it's funny, it's that when I saw this episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I was a sophomore in high school, and it just so happened that a week after I watched this episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, where Carlton's talking about his role as being the captain of the debate team, he's going to help him get scholarships and get access to the Ivy League schools that he wanted to get into. And I, I was like, that sounds like a really great plan and idea. I didn't really have too much else beyond that. I played football, baseball, all poorly. And so my real sort of uh, outlet and avenue was this debate thing. And so a week after that, a guy came to my AP English class and was like, hey, listen, there's an opportunity to do this thing called debate. Now, it's funny is that it wasn't just the person who was but it was a lot more the guy who came to speak to us about debate and was like, listen, who here wants to master their universe? And I was like, ooh, ooh this sounds exciting. Of course, everyone around me was like, okay. Uh, but I was like, that sounds exciting. And he said, well, the thing about debate is that it's something that challenges you to, to individualize, to become the kind of person that you should be in life. And I was very sort of aimless at the time, and so it, I was immediately sort of allured to the idea and concept. And so as he kept on sort of speaking about the benefits, the advantages, the fact that you learn about how to do really good in-depth research, how you learn how to synthesize information, how you learn to process and construct argument, how you sort of imagine and understand reasoning. And so all of these things sort of coming together really sort of made a compelling case for me to join debate. I probably haven't done the same thing for you just yet, but I'm hoping to do so as we sort of stretch this along. And so, well, one of the interesting things that I found out about where politics meets psychology, or at least debate meets psychology, is I found an interesting little snippet of an article from a guy named Ray, hold on one sec, Ray Herbert, who wrote for the Association of Psychological Science. And what he did was he did a little bit of an interesting study well, the, that he was examining the role of partisanship in politics. And I thought this was pretty interesting as I was sort of preparing for this lecture. And what he talked about was, well, the unfortunate reality is Americans won't get much in the way of detail and explanation. Moderators will not press very hard for nuts and bolts, allowing candidates to evade attack and unhelpful generalities. They preach and pretest and catch phrases rather than explaining the difficult day-to-day -day realities of decision-making in a democracy. Cynics say it doesn't matter that voters' minds are made up. Well, voters need to understand the prosaic details of complex policies. Most have staked out posi positions, and they need to understand uh, those recent positions, which take hard intellectual work. Most opt for simplistic explanations, assuming wrongly that they comprehend the nuances of their beliefs. And so what he found was that as people sort of had to walk through the, a detailed explanation, the nuances of their political ideologies, their positions that they would advance in debate, they found them to be far less what? 
extremists. They found them to be more moderate, and they had to really think about the nuts and bolts of their passions, their, their advocacies. And the same thing is what I'm going to ask you to do as you prepare for your debates. And so, well, let's jump into a potential psychology debate, which is nature versus nurture. Who here can make a, a case for nature or nurture? Anybody? It matters more that you're raised than the biological makeup that you have. Here's proof. What? And somebody's got to have an example or something, right? Okay, well, how about this? Is, um, well, when I was at Kansas State University, the past place that I was here before I got here, uh, I met a young woman named Jal Jalisa Jackson. And Jalisa Jackson was one of the most unshakable, most determined people I'd ever met. Uh, and to be totally honest, I thank her for giving me a lot of inspiration to, to, to do more with my life because she came from a very impoverished area, uh, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, it's, it's one of the worst areas of Kansas. Uh, very, very low incomes, high degrees of domestic violence, uh, incarceration rates for, for people in the area. And she um, had a very wild experience. She was one that she had to leave home. She lived in a car for a year. She then moved in with her grandmother, helped support her grandmother, helped support most of her family, and then decided to go get her college education. And so she ended up at Kansas State, and I was fortunate enough to work with her on the debate team. And so for a lot of people, they might say that the, the, the development of that area, the development of the sort of prescriptions socially that are likely to happen to people in that area would mean that she is more likely to end up not where she was. But she, I think, did something that I have been, been inspired by, which is she managed to, to sort of overthrow these shackles of expectations from her. I mean, her, her parents didn't think that she would accomplish that. Her teachers didn't think she would accomplish that. And she was able to do so. And so that was something that was amazing to me. What, what about for you? Okay, fair enough. Well, well, we'll come back to that then. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about how we sort of do this stuff. And so, the first thing I want to talk to you about doing debate is the importance of research. Now, who here knows how important research is in debate? I mean, why is research so important to any of the claims that you make in any debate? Well, think about with your friends, even. Why is research important? Research doesn't have to mean like I spend 12 hours studying how awesome um, the Big Bang Theory is. Uh, you can make compelling cases that use evidence that aren't just, well, according to so-and-so, uh, testimony. We, you can have personal examples, personal experiences, the, the, the feelings that happen to you as you watch that show, for example. And so there are lots of ways to sort of develop research. And so as you think about research, don't think of it in such a finite scope as just something that is happening in academia. Rather, it's something that happens everywhere and we are allowed to use it as we meaningfully put it into the equation of our debate. And so some of the things that you need to realize, first off, is research wins debates. Is that if you want to successfully defend your argument in your debate, you will have to do the research beforehand, which means you're not procrastinating. It means make sure you're putting your energy and inspiration into finding out what's the best way to defend what it is you're defending. Well, what else? Well, how do we evaluate research? That's sort of a, a much more sort of murky position. It's that as the, the internet has exploded in sort of its breadth of information, you have a lot of stuff out there that is less reliable, less quality research than others. And so how do we, let's see, how do we determine what is quality research? Okay. Sources help make for, well, they give you broader credibility. And so question of credibility, if you want to be more credible in front of your audience, especially if you're not an expert on the issue, it's probably good to bring in someone who is an expert that backs up your larger claim. What else? How do we evaluate research? Okay, so think about this. If I were to ask you about the nature versus nurture debate, and I was to, to drop a, an interesting study from the 50s, would that be a valuable understanding for the discussion of nature versus nurture today? Why not? 
recency. Recency is another very important criteria for determining what is the best information. Now, that doesn't mean that you necessarily need the, something from today or yesterday to determine and make your ongoing argument, but you want to get things that are largely contextual to the situations that we now understand we're facing today. What else? How about credibility? So let's discuss credibility. How do we assess someone's credibility? Well, what does it mean to be credible? Education. Well, that's certainly a way to be credible. And so if I have a certain number of degrees, that probably suggests that I'm credible at least in those fields that I have degrees in, right? OK, that's a fantastic sort of start. What else? Reliable. Reliable. Well, how do we determine whether someone's reliable? Okay, so experience is another great criteria. It's for example, my dad. My dad never went to college, but he did practice jewelry for 40 years. And so by the end of his career, he was a master jeweler. And despite the fact that he had no fancy degrees sort of back up that claim, he produced work that would suggest that uh, for everyone to see. And so it's important for us to understand that experience also can provide substantive effort to determine whether someone is credible or not. What else? How do you determine what is credible? Like where it came from? Exactly. So anybody, I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term bias. Is how do we determine bias? Well, what is bias? You lean more towards one side and exactly correct. You have a disposition sort of already established one way or the other. And so if I were to get uh, something for nature versus nurture debate that was from nature trumps nurture every time dot com. Would that be a fantastic, credible place to draw information from in that debate? But it makes the comparative assessment in the name of the web page. Of course it's not biased. It's just saying <coughs> after a real examination of the issues, nature trumps nurture every time dot com. No, clearly that is probably somebody who has already sort of determined their conclusion long before they actually were sort of uh, organizing and going through or disseminating their research. And so it's important for us to understand that we need to look for bias. And so what kind of things can help us identify bias? There's plenty of stuff from both sides. Okay, do they weigh the issue fairly? Opinions. Opinions. Well, is it back in opinion or is it back to research? You know, I'm sure we're all familiar with the water cooler talk. You know, what happens in like workplaces, people get together and they complain, they nitpick about the workplace. That's oftentimes full of really reliable information, right? I, I, I can't help but think about this movie my wife and I watched yesterday. About the, this guy, it's an Italian guy sitting around with a couple other Italian guys and he's just like, you know what? I, 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 swear, you, I swear to everyone here, in 10 years we're all going to be speaking Chinese. And there's no effort at all to sort of back that claim up. It's just like, this is truth. Well, that's probably... <laughs> That's probably indi indicative of a couple of things. One is uh, a little bit of xenophobia. Two uh, is a little bit of a, well, it, it, there's a claim without any sort of evidence to back it up. And so someone who probably has a predisposed opinion without any effort to try to actually follow through what that means. And so it's important for us to follow through things like methodology when we examine research, make sure that their results are reliable, are valid, are largely applicable. And that's the beauty about this course is y'all look at developmental psychological theory, correct? Yeah, and so that is, I mean, in my research for this, is that I found that it fits debate quite well, is that it literally seeks to go out of its way to say that there is no sort of global easy answer for explaining psychological phenomena. Rather, it's a question of specificity, of contingencies. There are a number of factors that go in and criteria that go into the way that we interact. And so to assume that there's one simple way to suggest that it's just biology, that it's just evolution, that it's just the way that we're raised that creates the kind of actions and the people we are, it's problematic because it fails to consider a lot of other things. True? True. And so that's why debate in this instance is fantastic, is because you are begging a very specific question with a very specific answer to look for what you think is best for us to understand about these psychological phenomena uh, in this given instance. And so that's why specificity of evidence is uniquely helpful when determining credibility as well. Is that if someone talks about, well, one of the things that uh, I used to face in debate a lot, a lot of times were 
there was this introduction of arguments called critiques that were a largely philosophical base. And so a lot of people would respond to these critical arguments with just these larger uh, arguments like postmodernism is stupid, uh, that your argument prevents action. Those sorts of things are these sort of totalizing claims that don't develop and attack the nuances of the claims being made or problematic. Why? Why should you be specific and nuanced with regards to the way that you advance argument? You okay? You okay? <laughs> Because it fits better. Because if I'm making larger claims, for example, if we're talking about gun control, and someone says we should ban assault weapons, and I respond with, you're not going to take all my guns, is that response a direct response to the claim made previously? No. Because the claim is not, I'm going to take your guns away, it's just that you can no longer purchase assault weapons in the future. You get to keep the ones you have, but no new ones. Yeah. And so that is a problematic sort of follow-up, is you have to follow the specific claim being made. And so if you follow the generalized claim that doesn't actually address the nature of the discussion that's being had, you will probably lose the debate. And so it's important to make sure that you develop nuance and specificity to evaluate the evidence you utilize in debates. And so well, let's talk about assessing sort of more broadly evidence. The library has a fantastic website, or a fantastic resource, that they call the Cars Guide. And so they give us four criteria that are easily, easily rememberable, uh, that will help you guide your research process. And so, is it okay, buddy? Uh, we start off with credibility. We've already talked about a little bit, a little bit about what that, what that means. And so who is the author? What's their name? Contact information. Uh, well, and that's a little bit less important than things like reputation among peers, background, experience, credentials, and education. You can also look at who is publishing the material that you're utilizing. If it is a reputable publisher, why would it be more reputable of evidence and argument being advanced? Websites. Like I said very quickly, is that there is a a large myriad of websites that might suggest that they are credible sources for you to utilize. Don't fall under that sort of assumption always. What are some things you can do to ensure that the websites you go to are more credible? Anybody here plan to use the web for the, some of their research? Yeah, probably everybody. So how do we assess credibility in, in website research? They're clearly like the, the main names, like .edu, .gov, those are all good ones, .org, usually. But even more beyond that, how do we sort of determine what is reputable information on the, on, on the web? So for example, do you want to start off with things like Wikipedia? I mean, it's a good place to look if you have no idea what you're doing. But beyond that, never cite it. Never use it more than that. It's merely just a very basic tool for you to get some more understanding of what's going on. Well, what else? Should you use things like encyclopedias? Sometimes, like, when we get their website, like, you'll have people like, commenting on things. Okay. Things. That's Sometimes great. That when we go, like, if we have, like, some of the possible like, Yahoo answers, like, that's just people's opinions and comments on things, so it's not necessarily credible. Very rarely they might actually substantiate their answer, but very often they're not. It's not the case. Yeah. Or often they're not. It's not the case. And so you may have, like, fantastic. one of the, like, as determined by the question and the crowd reading the question and answers. And so if you have like a crowd of 13-year-old children, you're probably not going to get maybe the most reputable and credible answer. Uh, the same thing is true with blogs. Be very wary of blogs. Get blogs from reputable sources alone and make sure you know that it's them writing it, not you know interns or other people that maybe work at the organization that might be hosting the information uh, in the first place. Secondly is accuracy. And so can you check for things like is the information correct? And so, like I said, looking at methodology, looking at reliability, looking at validity of the research that you're examining. Reasonableness. Is it reasonable? Is it biased? Does it actually try to deliver and give the audience the opportunity to come up with a conclusion themselves rather than to guide them in a slanted way towards that conclusion? And lastly, support. And so one of the best things I want to tell you really quickly is you need to make sure that as you do your research, you almost start with the works cited page. 
why would you want to start with the references and the work cited page before you even really look at the or read the article? helps you determine what's credible. I mean, if you're looking at basic psychological theory and they don't draw upon the basic psychological authors who came up with those ideas or use research that's been very important to supporting that theory, that's probably not the best article to utilize. Make sense? And so follow sort of the trail that is the work cited. Is that gives you a great idea, not only to determine whether or not the article you're reading is credible, but also to find more credible research if you need to find that. It's a great way to, I mean, it's a shortcut to more research that you can use to advance your argument. All right, let's, let's jump from the boring stuff and we'll get to the more interesting stuff about how we actually debate better. And so the thing I want to talk to you next is about how to actually engage in reputation. And so, what does it mean to engage in reputation? I'll, I'll definitely email this so that y'all can have that if you'd like it. So what is reputation? I'm sort of old school, I'll write on the chalkboard. I apologize. So what does it mean, well what is reputation? Oh, please. Exactly. If someone makes a claim and you actually refute it, you answer it in totality. And so, how do we do that? Well, it's a little bit more difficult than it just may seem on the, the top level. And so, it starts off with step one. <coughs> they say. And so, you describe the claim that your opponent is making. Well, where do we go next? They say this, but that's wrong. And so they say nature trumps nurture in every instance. However, but that's not true. Nurture is a much more determining factor for us to determine the outcome or the likely social interactions that person will have. So then they go, well, guess what three is? <coughs> well, why? Why but? And so it allows you to look at things like, well, like what? If you're to support your argument, what kind of things might you want to utilize to support your argument? What's that R word I used earlier on? Well, research, yes, actually, that, that's true. I mean, I mean reasoning, sadly. But we'll, we'll get there. Reasoning first. And so as we talk about reasoning, well, how do we reason? How do we do this? We always talk about how important it is to be reasonable, to have reason, but how do we demonstrate reasoning? Okay, yes, and so what do we do with it? Well, we do things like we develop inductive and deductive reasoning. Anyone familiar with those two things? Okay, what does it mean to induce, to, in, to do inductive research or to inductive reasoning? Is it just to go in depth in research, like for research? Okay, so it's these are the two options to go from specific to broad or go from broad to specific. Which one do you think is inductive reasoning? <coughs> It's the other one. <laughs> Specific to broad. Because think about it this way. The, uh, the, 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 easy sort of, uh, the easy answer for me is always the other one, is to do deductive. And so if you deduce something, what, if, what are you doing? You're drawing a specific conclusion based off a large number of things. And so you are reducing what you're evaluating. So deduce, reduce, to go from broad to specific. Inductive reasoning is to go from specific to broad. And so for example, uh, I could take my Jalisa example, and that would be inductive reasoning for me to say from this specific example, I can make a broader claim based upon that. 
there are also other types of reasoning. Reasoning by principle, reasoning by analogy. I won't go into a lot of those because we don't have a lot of time, but hopefully you get the idea. Is you need to develop reasoning. And as you develop reasoning, you also need to be wary of doing what? Making logical fallacies. Anyone familiar with logical fallacies? What's an example of a logical fallacy? That, that, that is exactly correct. But sort of, there are a lot of differing names for these, these logical fallacies that we talk about. For example, anyone ever heard of the bandwagon fallacy? And so what does it mean for someone to engage in the bandwagon fallacy? Exactly. It, they're doing it, and so that means it's the right thing to do in this instance. That is problematic. The slippery slope fallacy. You know what the slippery slope fallacy? If you do this, then this and this and this and this are guaranteed to occur. And so one of my favorites uh, on the slippery slope debate, well, is uh, people who say that if we allow things like stem cell research, and that means we devalue life, and that means we're going to engage in eugenics, and we're going to kill off all the undesirable populations of the world. That is some of the most, well, not bizarre reasoning I've ever heard, but hopefully you understand that follows a very slippery slope that doesn't have definitive backing for the claims being made. To say that stem cell research might lead to some investigations of eugenics, possibly, but to guarantee that it ends up in eugenics as governmental policy or social policy, unlikely at best. And so, fallacy is something we need to make sure we're looking out for. For example, um, if I respond to someone's argument with you're being a jerk, is that, is that logical reasoning that answers the claim being made? Well, I am questioning the credibility of the person making that statement. They are a jerk, which means everything they say should be thrown out the window. Not really, not really. And so, what's problematic about that? The nature of the discussion, exactly. And so there is no truth seeking there, it's more of a, I want to find an easy way to avoid having to engage this question. All right, well, what about if you say, well, Okay, it's nature versus nurture, it's nature over nurture rather. And I'm like, well you say nature, I say aliens. It's aliens, we are actually, aliens came here, we dropped some sweet DNA, and then we are alien children. We're all okay with that, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, well, that's what's called a red herring. It's to create something that distracts or tries to step away from the actual focus of the debate. And so, for example, you said nature over nurture, and then I said aliens. Does it quite follow the, the dance of debate that should happen after that? Well, what else? Well, we should also look at things like, as mentioned before, is the research or evidence. So there are lots of different types of evidence, things like testimony, examples, all of those sort of help you sort of make a broader case for what you're trying to do. You can also look at things like historical or personal examples. Um, and so we need to look at historical and personal examples. I use the example of of Jalisa, the, the young woman I was fortunate enough to work with at Kansas State. That helps me make a broader claim of support for why I think that it's much more nurture, better than uh, Trump's nature. Uh, and lastly, we should look at things like, well, significance. Significance, why? What, is the, the, what does it mean for you to demonstrate significance? Well, yes, but also if, it could be that if it actually has a greater sort of scope of determining the debate that we're having. So for example, I'm sure you're all familiar with the debate about, about gun violence and the discussion about violent video games being an influential factor and in whether or not someone will be violent or has a greater proclivity to being violent, correct? And so, one of the things that I would say is that for my personal history and understanding, and it, it, well, I play a lot of video games, because I did. And so, I would say that I'm not more likely to be uh, violent, and so I would say